Kitco News special coverage of Paris Blockchain Week Summit is brought to you by Okra, permissioned DeFi composable index and strategy execution platform. We're talking to the founder and host of London Real, Brian Rose. He is a broadcaster, former Wall Street banker turned YouTube celebrity. Brian, welcome to the show. Great to be here. Thanks for your time. Loving what you guys do. Oh, loving what you do. You've got a big fan base. So um, a lot of people who watch your show know who you are. Uh, for those who may not have seen uh, your program or have watched your interviews, tell us a bit about your background. Yeah, so I'm the founder and host of London Real. We've been broadcasting on YouTube for 10 years to yeah. celebrate our anniversary. Right. Uh, over 2 million subscribers on that platform. I think our video has been watched over a billion times. And then a year ago, I uh, founded the Crypto and DeFi Academy. Nice. So I've graduated over 1,000 students in over 50 countries in basic crypto protocols. Okay. So it's been a crazy adventure. I ran to be mayor of London last year, and uh, it's just been uh, a very different experience from who I was before, which was a Wall Street banker. Um, I spent time in New York City, Chicago, and London doing fixed income derivatives, credit derivatives, and I saw the kind of deep inner beast of our central banking sector. I walked away from it for 10 years, and now I'm back with a vengeance for crypto and DeFi, and uh, I'm trying to bring a different take to it, uh, okay. and I love this market. We're gonna come back to crypto, your education program, and why you transitioned to the crypto space, but first let's talk about the state of financial affairs around the world. You've worked on Wall Street, you've interviewed a lot of economists, so you've got a good sense of what's going on currently and in the past. How would you describe the current state of affairs from a financial perspective? What are some of the things that bother you right now with our financial system? Well, 2020 was a huge paradigm shift because we saw all of a sudden the, the world in a different way. And people that had never noticed before started to see that the government's printing money in excess, yes. that we maybe don't have the freedoms that we thought we had. And I think people started to really, for the first time, also see blockchain as an alternative to what a currency could be. And so I saw a lot of people changing the way they think about things. Also, we saw our information being restricted, social media, et cetera. And we started asking questions about our health and who we are. And so this is a time of inquiry and a time where people are thinking maybe the old way isn't the way we need to go in the future. And that means governments, banking systems, information systems. And so people are questioning things. And I think it's a time for innovation. A lot of people feel uncertain, but we also see a lot of solutions at the same time. So I'm super optimistic. I'm also super sometimes wary of where our current system is heading. So we're at this kind of really strange crossroads right now that some people find exciting, some people find scary. Yeah, you've never experienced this kind, this level of quantitative easing in your career on Wall Street, have you? No, it's something we've always talked about and saw. I started on Wall Street in 1993 as a yeah. fixed income derivatives trader at Bankers Trust. And, you know, we talked about this concept of quantitative easing, but we never saw the Fed pump money into the system. They controlled short term interest rates. That's all they really did. They never bought back securities out through the yield curve. So this is something we saw happen after the financial crisis in 07, 08. And then, of course, with lockdown, that went out of control. And I've never seen anything like it. I don't really know how to even react as a banker because all my preparations was based on things that you could control. I guess it's good for commissions. Yeah, it's probably good for commissions. And now my mom knows what quantitative easing is, you know? <laughs> so maybe the world is becoming more aware. We used to just trust the bankers and have them run our money. Right, okay, so with quantitative easing comes inflation, comes a lot of other side effects, if you want to call it that. Now, do you, first of all, do you agree with what the government has done since 2020? Was it necessary to have printed an astronomical, unprecedented level amount of money. Um, I've heard both camps. Curious to get your thoughts. It's a great question. I had a guy named Jeff Booth on my show who wrote a whole book about deflation before the crisis happened. Yeah. And he said that every, every society, back to the Romans, to the Weimar Republic in Germany, always ends up overprinting their money and it fails. So it's almost a human phenomenon, one of a lack of discipline perhaps. Sure. And so I could say, uh, sit here and call out the Fed and said they printed too much money. But also it's a very human reaction when you don't have a disciplined system set in place. And so as opposed to try to point my finger and say print less, it's almost a phenomenon of a fiat currency. And that's why when I, I look to blockchain, I look for a way to be more transparent and more disciplined. So I won't say it was the wrong thing to do. It was almost what they had to do. And again, they work on an election system that's uh, decided by voters, and then they have to put in a financial policy to make those people happen. So the system is almost destined to fail as a human experience. And that's why looking at technology is maybe a way to break that cycle. That's been a 2,000 year cycle. You've worked through, I guess, 
a few major market crashes, 2008, what we had in 2020. Uh, were you on Wall Street in 1987? No, I missed okay. the stock market crash, right. but I saw the Asian crisis, the Russian crisis. 2000, you were there for Yeah, that. the mortgage crisis. I, wa I went through it as a credit derivatives broker in London. It was good for business, a lot of volatility, and then it took the market out. I've seen so many crashes before, but I never saw this level of printing money. And it's disturbing. It's also one thing you see as a trader on Wall Street is you realize humans are cyclical. There'll be another crash in 10 years. There'll be another sure. crisis in five years. We're just not good at long-term management of our finances. And that's why I think you have to look at some other ways of putting discipline in that system. Well, let's just speculate as to um, what may happen. So if you just take a look at the last three crashes you've got in 2001, uh, tech bubble crash, yeah. so overvaluation of tech stocks, a sector that was relatively unknown at the I time. I was there for that. I was a CFO of a dot-com startup in New York City, and uh, we watched it go up, and then we watched it crash, including my equity. And so, yeah, I was there for that. 2008 mortgage crisis, so root causes were different. Uh, 2020, we had COVID, which was unprecedented, so a uh, huge amount of fear in the market. Now, what's building up for the next correction? Like you said, cyclical. Another crash is bound to happen. What's winding up that could lead to a crash, you think? Well, one thing about being, say, in the crypto space is everybody wants to sell out fiat currencies as right. in something that's just not long-term viable. I actually personally think the dollar is going to be here for a long time. Uh, it's still the best currency in the world. It's backed by the best government, the best military, maybe some of the smartest entrepreneurs in the world. So I don't think it's going to end anytime soon, uh, which means we're stuck in the same system of further printing and further the world dealing with the system. I don't think crypto is going to challenge that per se in the next five to 10 years, but I think we're going to start to see a parallel world. It's like those old episodes of Star Trek right. where you get to see another world that exists over here. If you look at the future price of everything in Bitcoin, it goes down in price. It's deflationary. The future price of everything in dollars always goes up in price. If you get most people to think about that, they said something's wrong with this system. So yeah, I expect sure. another crisis. I expect even more quantitative easing, but I also expect the dollar to still be viable and usable for at least 20, 30, 40 years. I'm just going to challenge you on a few yes. points just to play devil's advocate Please. here. Now, you mentioned that we're in the best government. Uh, some might disagree with you and say, well, the government's mismanaged our money. They've, inflation's out of control. That's the government's fault. Um, some would say that, look, the foreign policy of the United States is a mess. The dollar is losing its status over time as a global reserve currency because at the same time, the U.S. is losing its empire, losing its hegemonic status is the world's superpower, sole superpower. We're moving towards a multipolar world, they argue. The U.S. is no longer the only big kid on the block. We've got China, we've got other players as well. We've got China and Russia de-dollarizing. And so going back to your point about the dollar being the strongest currency, some would argue that might not happen in 20, 30 years. It's a limited window of dollar strength. How would you respond to all these criticisms towards the United States? Yeah, the U.S. has made some very poor decisions uh, and have lost a lot of people's faith in the dollar, for yeah. sure. And uh, I had Alex Mashinsky on my show, who was the yes. CEO of Celsius recently, and he said, Brian, World War III is not going to be a ground war. It's not going to be fought with tanks. It's going to be a currency war between the dollar and the, the yuan. And it's probably going to be a CB, you know, a central bank currency war. And so we all have to prepare for what that's going to mean for our reality. The U.S., especially recently with some of the conflict in Ukraine and them pulling dollars from people out there, it has lost a lot of long-term credibility, and it's definitely retreating. But what's going to take its place? Potentially the yuan. We're going to see how that technology gets rolled out through its partners throughout the world. But you can also criticize the dollar, but I don't see anything else stepping up anytime soon in the Western world. Yeah. Now, we'll see what the yuan happens. Uh, there's 60 million people that have that. Uh, central bank digital currency. Apparently it's been rolled out and it's pretty dark what it looks like. Right. Um, and so I'm very curious if we can create a US digital dollar that respects freedom and privacy. If we can, I think we win. If we can't, then yeah, we probably continue degrading and then we go the way of the Roman Empire. Um, okay, before I move on, let's expand on that because that was really deep. Head towards the way of the Roman Empire. Well, we know what happened. Um, if history repeats itself, we're seeing what, the dissolution of the US empire? Well, they kept printing money is what they ended up doing right, okay. uh, because that was their only way of staying viable. Yeah. We see the U.S. to continue to print money. It's ultimately going to be, like I said, uh, a global currency war. Yeah. Who can yeah. export their version of values in forms of a currency? This is a very important point. I recently had uh, Christian Carlo in my studio, former chairman of the CFTC for four years. He created the Bitcoin's futures contract. And he said, Brian, the digital dollar is something we have to make sure respects 
that all the values of America, freedom, privacy, lack of censorship, if we can create that digital dollar, we can export it to the world and we win. If not, the yuan, which is all about censorship and control, will be exported to the world, even that technology exported to other countries and currencies, and we're gonna lose the war, maybe the most important war of humanity, because let's be honest, financial freedom is paramount to every other freedom. If you don't have that, you won't have the chance to speak freely, act freely. And so yeah, there's a lot on the line right now. Let's, the next five years are crucial. Before we talk about financial freedom, let's talk about political and freedom of speech. Political freedom and freedom of speech go hand in hand. Um, just overall, look, you are a media personality. You've worked in media for a long, long time. You understand the space better than most people. How would you say the media's role has changed in shaping public perception? We've seen starting from when I guess when you entered your career on Wall Street, the media be controlled by cable television, radio shows, uh, the government, basically people with the uh, physical and hardware ability to disseminate messages. Now we've got, with the advent of social media and technology, anybody can YouTube, anybody can podcast, anybody can telegram. How has this changed media? It's changed it in every way, shape and form. I mean, 10 years ago I started broadcasting, putting conversations on YouTube. It was a very new platform. I think I was first restricted to 15 minutes only. And I found that the world had a real desire for content shared peer to peer with new ideas, new values. That's gotten bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And it's changed the narrative. The problem that happened is the tech companies got so powerful, more powerful than governments. And on April 6th of 2020, uh, we had the second largest YouTube live stream in the world. And that episode was deleted and banned by YouTube about an hour later. So I got a real crash course in the fact that these tech platforms were controlling things were censoring things, and I could never really figure out why or how, but what I did realize was that freedom of speech was such an important thing for us to try to preserve, just like our, our freedom of financial and, and the freedom of the dollar. And so when I experienced that and I went through it, and a lot of people did, and we saw a lot of information wars in 2020 and 2021, we're still fighting to get something called the truth or people's yeah. opinions, or even to have an exchange in a conversation where we disagree. We have to continue to preserve that. I think we're seeing some headway, but we're still seeing Web 2.0 control much of the social media, much of the media platforms, and we have to just keep fighting for it. Blockchain might be able to take out that middleman, but it's something that I think about every day and that uh, we try to fight for that information. Coming from the banking sector, they don't really want you to talk about crypto and DeFi. The government doesn't really want you to talk about crypto and DeFi because it unseats their power but we need to get them kind of on board that this is part of the future. Well, correct me if I'm wrong, Brian, but isn't freedom of speech something, uh, an unwritten contract between the government, the political state versus a citizen? I mean, when Twitter bans Trump or when you got you know, removed from YouTube on that episode, is that really attack, an attack on your freedom of speech as much as it is simply just a private entity disagreeing with your viewpoint? I mean, if you came to my house and you started uh, saying things I disagree with, I could, I'd have the right to say, Brian, please leave my home. Isn't that what's happening on YouTube? It's not, I'm not challenging your freedom of speech. I just don't agree with you. Yeah, I went long and deep on all the philosophy <laughs> surrounding freedom of speech, and I had a lot of these conversations yeah. during that time. What does, freedom, get your take, yeah, yeah. what does freedom of speech entail? What if you yell fire in a crowded theater? Right. Which, by the way, that's almost always taken out of context. It's a private platform. They can do whatever they want. And I thought long and hard about this. The, the truth is, is that these technology companies, they were the only way to exchange information between people during these times. And there was even precedent in UK law that they would have to actually respect the rights of what's happening in the local land and the government. I personally believe that you need to be able to have a conversation with another human. Now, it shouldn't incite violence. It shouldn't incite the overthrowing of governments, but there shouldn't be a technology platform that's ubiquitous that can have rules that, that actually go against the rules of the land. And that's what I saw happening there. So I thought quite long and hard about this. It's definitely up for a healthy debate, but silencing opinions has never proven the right thing in history. Burning books, censoring people, it's never proven the right thing to do. So we have to get this out in the open, almost air out the, isn't there the laundry. A, isn't there a fine line though? What if I went out and said the Holocaust never existed? There, what would there, you do? There's definitely a fine line, although you know I had a professor on my show from MIT that, that used to defend the rights of everyone around. Okay. So there is a fine line, and then we have to actually kind of always ask what it is. You know, again, violence, overthrow, these type sure. of things. But we also need to push that line and try to see if we can have conversations. Because most people don't have opinions. They just regurgitate what they hear in the media. And until you challenge them, they don't have to actually think for themselves. So freedom of speech is also the freedom to be heard. 
And again, I, I kind of went really deep on this when I was going through that whole period because I asked myself these same questions. It's a private company. They can do what they want. Yeah. Uh, why, well, I shouldn't be allowed to say something offensive to someone. If I came to your house, you should be able to throw me out. But the flip side of that is you shush all debates. And that way we don't ever actually entertain ideas. Most of my guests on London Real over 10 years, they came in and I disagreed with them. They made me uncomfortable. I didn't really like them. Three years later, many times, I ended up actually agreeing with them. So I, I think that dissonance is important yeah. to foster. I think it was Anne Ryan who said that, uh, look, you, can have, you have the right to say whatever you want, but I don't necessarily, I'm obligated to provide you with a platform. Mm. It's an interesting point of view. Yeah. Again, what is a platform these days? Right. That's kind of fascinating. And again, as we go from web 2.0 to 3.0, right. you know, maybe I'm on the blockchain where people want to individually consume what I want and yeah. I don't have to check with a gatekeeper like you know, sure. YouTube or a Google. Sure. And again, I thought long and hard about this. I had a 10 year relationship with YouTube. It's not as if they were some bad guy trying to do this. Sure. Uh, they were actually acting on behalf of all of the users, all of the sponsors, all of this. It was a collective, but we have to keep this open debate up. You can't ban people from these major technology platforms. Right. I just think it's the wrong thing to do. Well, let's talk about financial freedom now. Um, big problem that a lot of people are facing is how to feel financially free from this system that they find oppressive. I'm talking about inflation eroding your wealth. I'm talking about the inability to transfer wealth across uh, nation states. Um, you know, it's difficult to, that, I guess it's where blockchain comes in. Because uh, previously, before blockchain, it was difficult to transact large amounts of money at a very, very low cost. So tell us about how blockchain could be the answer to financial freedom. First of all, it was very hard to see what inflation was really doing to your assets before. You could talk about it as a concept. If yeah. you got a degree in economics from MIT or Harvard, you would understand it. But to show it to the average person was very difficult. And that's why, like I said, with Bitcoin, if you price everything in the future in terms of Bitcoin, it goes down in price. Everything in the price of the future of the dollar goes up in price. So for the first time, we actually see that parallel universe where you can say, oh, there is another way. And now people like my mom, 78 years old in San Diego, California, knows what quantitative easing is, knows what inflation is, is concerned about their dollars, which used to be all you would do. But it's just a account. very educated person. Yeah, well, she is now. And so, <laughs> so now they're seeing cryptocurrencies as an alternative. Stablecoin yields got a lot of people eyes open. You know, first Bitcoin was, uh, you know, the gateway drug of crypto. Then it was stable coins because you can get an 8% yield on your dollars. Uh, and people said, well, wait a second, how can I get that? And I can't get that in my banking account. Well, let me question, maybe that's the Federal Reserve. Maybe the dollar is being held down and, uh, on your yields and the crypto shows what it's really worth. It's, it starts to have conversations. And so I find this extremely interesting. If you were a citizen in Canada recently or Ukraine or Russia, and you saw what happened with your situation, your local currency, your accounts being freezed and the ruble dropping, you would have all wished you had a MetaMask account with some uh, stable coin that you could walk across a border with 12 passwords in your head. All these things are becoming almost no brainers for people to protect their assets, control their assets. So it's an incredible time. It seems to be happening at the perfect time to have this parallel asset. If we didn't have crypto, yeah, I, I don't know the conversations we'd be having right now. Um, and so many people are now involved in this asset space. Let me ask you this, just Brian, do you feel like your financial freedom is at stake or is challenged right now? Well, back in 2020, uh, my PayPal account got, got pulled, you know, when we got uh, banned on YouTube. And so for a while there, I thought, are my bank accounts going to be pulled? Is my business going to be persecuted because of something someone said on my show? By the state? Well, by the banking system, by anything. Could have been the government, Ofcom. And so I had a real brush with the realities of what could happen. So every day do I walk around thinking my assets will disappear? No, but I have seen that it can and could happen. And so I start to look at some of these other systems that are trustless and permissionless and I can have custody of. And it's starting to make sense for a percentage of a portfolio to be in there. Again, I'm very conservative, but this technology makes sense even from a freedom perspective. So. I don't worry about it every day, but I have had to brush with it. And, you know, you never know what's going to happen. Look what happened in Canada recently. You're involved in a protest. Not only is your crypto suspended, your bank accounts are suspended. Most people would have never thought that could happen in a G7 country. If you're in Russia right now, even if you're in the East and have nothing to do with the conflict, your local currency has now gone down. Your real estate prices have gone uh, down and all of your stock prices have gone down. So it's viable. In Canada, they were labeled as a terrorist for protesting against the government. Yeah, your bank account could be suspended. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. That's was was that something that you envisioned it to happen? To, to, to have in, 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 a, in a first world G7 country, like you say? I would have never thought that would have happened. But then again, I don't know why I didn't think that could have happened. It was a great wake-up call to everyone that it could happen. And stranger things have happened, and they will continue to happen. So we all need to take control of your finances now. You can't just let the bank handle it anymore, so, which is the way we grew up. So why would you, as an individual, invest in cryptos or Bitcoin in particular? Is it a way for you to move away from the government, or do you have another thesis? So first of all, Diversification is very good. Okay. Having control over my assets that don't depend on a bank or a government uh, or an exchange or a regulator, also very important. Yeah. Having things that are stable, having things that are diversified, invested in a technology as well. I, I love all of these concepts. Okay. Again, I don't put a huge percentage of my portfolio in there, right. but I'm also educating myself by doing that. Will that move more in the future? Yes, as we get better security options, I think yes as well. Yeah. We also need some clarification on regulation as well because yeah. you know, we all forget who got Al Capone. It was the IRS. They got him for tax evasion, not for the 100 plus murders. So you have to make sure you do everything right by the government That's and follow right. those laws. Yeah, tax but evasion. we can educate those regulators. Governments aren't some separate people than us. They are us. And again, I ran for, for office in London. I almost became the mayor of London. Politicians care about two things, your vote, and money that they can spend to get your vote. If you show them a better way of doing it, they will do it. So every day I try to come to work and try to educate everyone out there. I get them by taking action. Most people are, are terrified to put money in crypto at first or stable coins at first, but once they do, they realize that it is the path for the future, so. Do you think that governments are using cryptocurrencies now as a promotional tool to gain popularity, especially amongst the younger people? You definitely see it more than you used to, uh, yeah. where parties say, I'm crypto friendly. Right. Uh, Are they the, really crypto friendly? Yeah, I mean, you need to show it by your actions right. you know, more than anything. But crypto does one thing amazing is they build communities like nobody else, even better than a political party to a certain extent. So they know they can tap into a community and this community cares about their assets, but the proof is in the pudding. I mean, they can talk the talk, they need to walk the walk. We need to see the regulations happening. We need to see the SEC advised, the CFTC advised. We need more than the president saying we're going to take a look at this for now. So I always tell my students in America, contact your local congressman and senator and tell them how you feel and get them to enact those policies. We need fair regulation. We need a lot of decisions made and probably not by the SEC. And uh, crypto sectors that you think have the most potential for growth. Yeah. I uh, jumped into the space about a year ago to get re-educated after sure. having little brushes with it over the years. Sure. Uh, I come from a finance background, an engineering background. What I find super exciting are the following things. Layer one solutions that speed up everything on the internet because Ethereum has just slowed down, uh, a victim of its own success, high gas fees, et cetera. And uh, I'm finding a ton of brain power and you know, billions of dollars invested in what could be just faster blockchains in the future. Stable coins, extremely exciting. Again, when I first looked at a US stable coin, I thought that's brilliant. The algorithmic stable coins happening with Luna are incredibly fascinating. People are seeing yield that they can get. My daughter is 18 years old. She owns stablecoin is getting a return on her investment. Uh, when I was 18, I never had an asset that returned money. We wouldn't have had one unless we bought a property and maybe rented it out. Yeah, or a CD or something like that. Yeah. Now, children are having a real relationship with money. And uh, again, they don't teach money in schools. And uh, I had Robert Kiyosaki on my show, uh, author of Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And he said, Brian, you know, uh, poor people work for money. Rich people make money work for them. And I'm seeing now that now average people can make money work for them by owning an asset that returns you know, yield like a stable coin. So I like that, but I'm also learning that the metaverse and the NFT space is all interconnected. So you can't just look at DeFi, you can't just look at Bitcoin. Sure. The metaverse is extremely exciting. We're all in a metaverse right now. People are watching us you know, through a metaverse. And so that's gonna be a crucial part. And GameFi, uh, or those metaverse tokens being financed, actually was one of the reasons Axie Infinity got so popular. And that's what Yatsu told me when he was on my show last year. He said, Brian, if it wasn't for DeFi, we wouldn't have had the success in the metaverse. And then finally, NFTs, they're fascinating. Again, they're just non-fungible tokens. Most things in the world are non-fungible, like a business or a piece of property. Um, but you have to understand all pieces if you want to be in this space. So uh, I guess those are the four sectors I'm going into. You don't think NFTs are a bit too frothy right now? I think some are frothy, yeah. but think of an NFT as all of your medical data. Think of an NFT as all of your browsing data on sure. Facebook that you can plug into a platform and be paid thousands of dollars a year for. Think of an NFT as your identity. So. Yeah, a JPEG with a ape head on it. Some of them are quite good and the networks are quite good. Uh, some of those are overvalued, but the concept of a non-fungible token 
it's going to be here forever and we're going to see it evolve into these fascinating ways that includes membership it shows provenance it shows whatever the digital flex scene it expresses your personality gives you access um, it's going to be here to stay but yeah don't, don't be careful where you put your money in it you spend a million dollars in a jpeg of a rock <laughs> Um, I think you're referring to Justin Sun, who was my guest, who founded the Tron Network, a layer That's one right, solution. Yeah. You know what? I think you would if you're Justin Sun, because Justin spends a million dollars on an ETH rock. He just spent $15 million on a board ape. And he does it because he understands the power of that media event. When someone sees him doing it, they'll buy into the space and they'll look into the space yeah. and they'll move on. So I actually applaud Justin when he does things like that. Right. Um, and, you know, it might be worth that. Who knows? It actually might be worth that. And there's the scarcity. Uh, I had uh, Jordan Belfort on my show recently, the Wolf of Wall Street himself, and he sure. bought a CryptoPunk for $400,000. I said, Jordan, why did you buy a CryptoPunk? And he said, Brian, it was the fastest way for me to learn about NFTs. Yeah, buy it yourself, exactly. And so I, I bought one a year ago. I gave one to my daughter, and I was the coolest dad in the world for a week. <laughs> I'm telling you, I could have given her a Corvette, and I wouldn't have been as cool. So I could see there's a real emotion that's happening here with humans and our, our sense of tribal behavior. So, and we've minted our own NFT to test the space and um, it's gonna be the future, but you know, we need a new word because NFTs are, <laughs> it's a terrible way to describe a phenomenon of capturing emotion, value, creativity between humans. Maybe you can coin a new term. I'm gonna try. <laughs> <laughs> final, final topic I'll let you go. You're working on a documentary. Tell us about that. You know, we've always made documentary films over the years at London Rail, usually yeah. with topics or guests that have kind of made us interest. I ran an Ironman race, I had an ayahuasca ceremony. We're always looking for things. So when it comes to crypto, I think the best way to tell a story is through reality. And so, yeah, we've actually uh, worked on a documentary last year, uh, did some filming for one today as well. And we want to show people the journey that an individual takes to get into crypto because we're storytellers. We've always learned by telling stories. I have two young boys, they're four and five years old. They understand a story. And so we want to do that through a documentary film to get people up the curb on crypto. This isn't going anywhere. I tell people you have to invest in this now and learn about this now. Uh, you can't outsource your finance and your future and your freedom to institutions. You, you have to take responsibility. And, and with that comes a, a, a lot of power and, and, and you have to take it seriously too. So yeah, that's what we're doing. Always creating media, always trying to get the word out there, always trying to educate people. I want to educate the next 1 billion people in crypto and DeFi. That's my plan. All right, well, we'll look forward to that documentary when it comes out. Thank you so much, Brian. Thank you. Appreciate what you guys do. You guys are incredible. Oh, you too, Brian. Thank you for your kind words. And thank you for watching Kitco News. David Lin. Kitco News special coverage of Paris Blockchain Week Summit is brought to you by Okra, permissioned DeFi composable index and strategy execution platform. 